um, did his master's work at the University of Illinois. He began his professional career in the illustrious office of Erosarnan and after that experience he went on uh, to work in the office of Daniel Mann Johnson Mendenhall where he became vice president in charge of design. Since 1968 Mr. Pelly has been in charge of design for Gruen Associates and those of you who are familiar with his work are aware that he has been recognized many times for his design work and tonight he will be sharing some of that work with us tonight. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you Cesar Pelli. Can you hear me in the back well? Fine. That's all right. What, what I will do, what I plan to do is this. I plan to show primarily one project, a project we did in, in Columbus, Indiana, which I think, oh, there are many things that interest me particularly. It covers uh, many of my interests, at least at that time. Of course, one keeps on changing. But at, and, uh, and I think it's a very good project as far as my work, as, as in my work is concerned. First, I will just cover a few slides some other projects that are critical to me so that you may know or remember who I am. And we can start with the slides, that's more fun. This is a project we designed at Daniel Mann Johnson and Mendenhall or Dim Gem in 1969 and we won a Progressive Architectures Award with this. Uh, we des designed this with uh, Tony Lamsden. apartments and it was a, a way of putting houses on, a, on top of a difficult site and how one deals with a large structure and how does it, that large structure relates to the physical environment. Those were 1,500 units hugging that hillside. Also at Dem Gym and with Tony we designed this uh, plant for Teledyne in Northridge, in the San Fernando Valley, of course. Could we turn the, the big light off? And also at MGM, I designed these laboratories for ComSat, that, which are metal and glass panels folding in the three-dimensional planes. The Strip windows are corridors, circulation, and when they are panels with punch holes in them, they represent individual offices. And also a project, public housing project in Hawaii, this is called Kukui Gardens. Uh, this is all subsidized housing, very low cost, and the purpose here was to do the most decent kind of dwelling space we could do for the people living there. Since I joined Gruen in 1968, or oh, maybe the most important thing we did, this was a team of us, eight of us, did this project that won the first prize in an international competition, and this was international headquarters and conference center in Vienna, Austria. And it's a flexible project dealing with issues of of growth and change, that's another view of it. You may have seen or published or in real life City Hall in San Bernardino. Same view. Uh, 
project that we did in Vancouver called Pacific Center, which is just a large department store that you see to the left and an office building to the right, and a second block is being developed now. And a speculative office building in Oakland, California, this is on Broadway, which is glass and, and metal panels again. Oh, one of the interesting things of this, as of the city hall, is that the windows are very small on the south, medium size, east and west, and very large on the north. You can see the south facade there with very narrow windows, and they change. The windows change according to the orientations of the building. And it's all an interesting technology, interesting to me, of stamped metal and glass. And sometimes you see the forms, and sometimes you see the glass. Um, but that's not the important issue. This is the project I wanted to talk about. The other was just as a, as a way of introduction. This is Columbus, Indiana, as it was before our project started. This is Main Street, which in this case is called Washington Street. And, uh, and the, the project was in that block. And this is about three shopping blocks. One beautiful building at the end of the street, the Bartholomew County Courthouse, built in 1870, quite a handsome structure. And next to it, our project. See, the courthouse is way at the left. And the project consisted, as, as we got the problem, was a shopping center. And by the way, I worked very closely in this project with Lance Bird and Victor Schumacher, who are also here. And uh, we, we worked at this for a good length of time, because it was not only to design a project, but to develop a program, which did not exist. The problem was a small shopping center, but the, as it had been set up by the redevelopment agency, but the real issue was how to bring life to the existing street. And those red sidewalks were the sidewalks that had people in them up till now, but it was rapidly dying. One small, tiny Sears department store. This is a town of 26,000 people, and this is part of the problem. And like all such towns and larger towns, they had been losing their downtown to suburban facilities, primarily shopping. So people st stopped coming to the center of town, and cities become disjointed. People retreat to their homes and their immediate environments and any sense of community. All of the, the extra things that a city can offer cease and disappear. And it's a process that, of course, most American cities have are going still through, and it was very acute in Columbus. And we felt that there was no difficulty in attracting people to see us. They would park, and the parking structure, the parking, really, the parking lot is north of that Sears store, and they would come from their cars to see a shop and go back to the car. So people would have been physically back downtown, but would have done nothing to the life of downtown. And we invented a space that we called it for a long time, a civic space, which is that large red shape. And uh, eventually it got renamed as the Commons. The people of Columbus chose that name, and I think it's a very good name for it. And and as the plan developed, it took that shape. The shopping center, the commons is at the end, which is the large block, and the rest is a shopping center, tiny shopping center, which is called Courthouse Square. Courthouse, because of the courthouse that is next to it, this is, and that's roughly the plan. This is how it looks in models, so there is a long spine, shopping arcade, skylight, and you can see that it gets bigger and larger where the commons is which looks a bit like that in a more detailed model with skylights and glass and a open an outside stairway to get to the second level. And if you remove the roof of that, and what I will show you first, which shows both the development, the project, our intentions, and then you can see how close we came to achieving our intentions. What I will show, I'm showing you right now is a presentation we gave to the developer when we proposed this idea. This is a presentation that we made about three and a half years ago. This is exactly the same slice in the same order that we used to, to express to them what is it that we were proposing. And there will be a mezzanine, not really needed in terms of function, but we thought it was extremely needed in terms of creating life to that space. And the idea of that space was a space that would collect most 
of the common activities to the people of Columbus. You know, this could have been called the Hall of the People of Columbus. Uh, the, in, a, in a way, we wanted this to, full f to function in American terms, in late 20th century terms, like a piazza functioned in Italy in the Renaissance, to have that very same kind of spirit, a place where people can go for specific things or for no reason at all, where you can meet friends and meet people who are not yet your friends. Anyway, this was, and the problem was how to activate it, how to make it real in American terms and not just a space that it gets built and nothing happens afterward. Immediately, we thought, as you can see, there is two levels there. Uh, it developed a little later and we, pro you know, into a model, which again was used in the presentation, of a space that would look sort of like that. So the primary issue was a space that was large enough, connected visually with the street, that would be used for a number of large functions, like dances or uh, special celebrations, special occasions, or the exhibit of large pieces of art, or any kind of impromptu happening or event. The, as some, then the, the issue became how to find opportunities and facilities for people to have events, in, to the, how to develop a space, not flexible, but a space that is adaptable. So the space doesn't need to change, but should be adaptable and suitable for a great variety of circumstances. And there is a small platform where you can see those two persons here. There is a small platform that acts as a stage, and it's also the first landing of the steps that go up to the right. And there, you know, seats could be brought around, and that platform could be used for rock concerts or country music. <laughs> Problems of high technology. <laughs> Folk dancing or puppet shows barbershop quartets, whatever. The idea with this was not so much to bring professional entertainers, as they indeed could occasionally, but the kind of performances that could be developed and, and presented by the people of the town itself, which then the kind of interaction is double, where the people of Columbus uh, will be not only spectators, but also performers and participants. And that kind of dual relationship, we thought it was much more important that if they brought every week the best spectacles in America. Uh, as another element, you can see there is a large piece of sculpture at the end. And that was quite a dear idea to me. The hope was, originally, to have an element that would uh, give take the homogeneity out of time. In modern society, time becomes highly homogenized when one day is equal to the next. As in contrast with a religious society of any kind, where there are a number of special days, the Sabbath or the Sunday is a very special day, different from the other days, qualitatively different, and then there are events during the course of the week or the year that also punctuate time so the time is not homogenized. And this was something to help to dehomogenize time at a very small scale. This, the idea was to have an element that would function like a glockenspiel, thus in Germany, where events, things would happen at certain times of the day at a specifically given hour. And this is a sculpture that Jean Tingeli had built for the Lausanne Fair and is now in Zurich. And at originally, you put about a quarter there and the machine went into this great paroxysm and agitation. Now it occurs at certain times of the day, that huge saucer-shaped thing goes up and down and clunks and the wheels turn and it churns and it pumps. And 
it's a great thing. So we convinced our client to engage Mr. Tingali to build such a thing afterwards, and this was a proposal to do it so, and he was engaged and he built a new machine that he called Chaos Number One or the image of our civilization. And, uh, that's the machine th that we proposed at that time. And next to it, to the left, see originally we had put just an element there that we knew had to do that function. We did not know what it was going to look like. A bit later, we thought of that to, to engage John Tingley, and that's what we showed. There is a ramp there, and the ramp has two purposes. One purpose, of course, is to move people up and down, but the primary purpose, which is secondary purpose, is to create a promenade. And uh, ramps have a quality that is different than a stairway or an elevator or an escalator or just moving horizontally, is that when one walks up or down a ramp, the person doing so is somehow, for a short moment, on stage. If they, that's the most beautiful thing of the Guggenheim Museum. It's not the paintings, but are the people walking up or down the ramp across from the space. And there's nothing so civilized and so delightful as watching other people, to have an opportunity to, those, to do so without being and intruding on anybody's privacy. And if you will notice persons who go up or down a ramp, suddenly they walk a little more straight and they look a little more handsome than they do normally. So uh, the ramp fulfills that important purpose. And at the same time, it creates a large sweeping promenade covering most of the space. And this is how we proposed it, going up it and you will look most of the space. And towards the end, it blends into what we hope to be a restaurant it ended up being a cafeteria, which is indeed more suitable for Columbus than a full-fledged restaurant. <laughs> and there would be some trees within the space that could remain green when all of the other trees and plants outside were bare in winter and covered with snow. And we thought that eating in the open, exposed, it's a good and important social function that tends to activate the space and makes out of the function of eating indeed a social function and not just a private one. And these were examples that we used to present our case. This is a, a shopping center, Rosedale, that the Gruen firm did in Minnesota, and another restaurant in Southdale, another shopping center that's done by Gruen in, in Minnesota. And the best example of all, of course, which is the farmer's market uh, in, in LA. And uh, this, on top of those things, we proposed a series to have a stair with extra large landings. And each landing would become a platform that could be used for meetings or lectures or exhibits. And the idea of the exhibits was that they could be of all sorts, photographs, or the kind of things that children themselves would do in the schools. So that is something that, again, people would come, you know, each child would bring, you know, his or her uncles and aunts and parents to, to watch the show and bring again people again into downtown. Or industrial products. The space real is two spaces. One like that, and then a small space to Okay, thank you. A small space to the left, which is a playground. We call it playground, but in reality, it's a playroom. It's an air-conditioned playground. This was, again, came after much and lengthy discussions with the people of Columbus about what kind of things were needed in Columbus and what do the people in Columbus do and do not do, what they are liable to do. And one thing that kept on recurring is that there are lots of mothers with small children and nothing to do during the day where the, when the husbands are working. So this was a place for the mothers to come and have a cup of coffee while the children are playing. And a coffee shop was placed and it's functioning there already called the apple tree next to the, to the playground. And that's how we presented the idea. We also proposed to acquire something similar to this and build it in and normal and regular toys. And 
children play, and it's a delightful thing to have in a place like that. They create a lot of activity, and there are mothers watching the children playing, and of course then there are even nicer still the people who watch the people who watch the children playing. <laughs> uh, this is what the playground ended up looking like with things for small tots and more adventuresome slides, places to eat a snack or to tell stories, to crawl under like a tunnel or to sit inside on a fireman's pole and a large uh, play tank built in. And as part of this, the thing continues into Courthouse Center, which is, of course, the shopping street, which we designed to look like that. And that is a large skylight that looks north only with the vertical wall in mirrors so that we have uh, really a two-sided skylight with two north sides and no, no heat again. And of course, shopping is what really brings the people into town. The, the, we were also particularly concerned with knitting and very carefully weaving this building into the fabric of town. And in the main street where the shopping is, we developed a very small scale, very much like the scale of the small shops that take place. Each one of these is a shop that has, each one has an entrance and they develop a rather small scale in the pattern of town. There is an arcade was had been developed in the post office next to our building. This was designed by Kevin Roach and John Dinkalu. And we continue the arcade, picked up across the street and creating one entrance to the civic space through the arcade. A street had been closed, Jackson Street, and we made a point of recognizing the closure of the street, creating a continuous pedestrian movement where the street had existed, and physically providing adequate terminus to the street so that it was not just an accidental thing. <coughs> uh, on the top, on the north, where you cross from the parking lot, you cross under a canopy and you have the secondary entrance to Sears at that level. The building is set back to provide a view and a plaza to the courthouse center and on the main street, third street, which is a heavy vehicular street, the back sides of the shops are there and a large parking lot. It also happens to be the main entrance to town, although at that point you had to make a sharp right turn, but over the bridge you had the first view of town and we did not want to have a parking lot as the main view of town. So an eight foot high berm, a double berm on the parking lot, a single berm against the building was developed, which is about a thousand foot long and now it's been planted with about 800 river birches. This is what we proposed the berm to look like on the parking lot and continuing in the center. And we proposed it lined with a line of flowers like this. Uh, this is what the center was proposed to look like. The small continuation of Jackson Street, which we call Jackson Square, the earth berm, an external entrance to the second level passing by and looking down into the into the playroom, the small courthouse plaza that opens the view and the center itself. And those are a couple of close-up views of that rendering. The trees were shown like that so that we could show the building. They are really quite different in reality as they finally ended up. This courthouse plaza was planted with uh, Japanese flowering cherries that have, because of the cherries in Washington DC, they have a civic connotation in America and they relate to the courthouse. Now, in terms of the forms of the building, this is a view of one of the blocks, what they call the model block. All of these buildings were built in the 1870s, rather handsome structures, and this was one of the best preserves of the blocks, and Alexander Girard was commissioned to remodeled them and he did a color scheme, suggested controls for those signs. As you can see, they are all special, nicely done signs. A canopy and shops below. But as you can see, they form a very high front, very hard, with a strong line, and the upper part is quite blank and hard, and the lower part is quite broken up. 
This is the ground floor of the model shops. And as you can see, the shops are not doing that well. And in the next block, the shops not do much better. And again, there is a small scale with a hard second facade. So we thought that was important to maintain in our building. And we have a broken up ground level elevation at about the same height as the canopies and, the, and a height that is similar to the most common cornice height in the existing Victorian buildings. And the building we thought would look something like that, quite glassy and quite open to the street so that it would become part of the street all the time. The ramp would project into one of those cylinders and this is what the street would look like. And this was the end of the presentation of the project that really shows most of the ideas and intentions we had at that time. And if we change carousels, uh, I'll show you now slides of the project almost finished. So that is now the commons right on Washington Street. And we wanted a building that would have the same scale as the old buildings, but not to be at all like the old buildings, but to be a building built 100 years later after a phenomenal technological revolution has taken place. So the building looks like a building of today and not a building of yesterday, but completely in the same scale as the old buildings. The courthouse tower at the end, uh, that's how the street looks like. At the end, at the, at the end closer to the shopping sidewalks, there is an air door so that there is no psychological barrier at all into going in and out of this space and towards the side street. This is how it looks from the from the other end of the, of the block. And this is the interior of the space. This is the chaos number one, the sculpture that John Tingley built, which is, we were very concerned about how the people in town would take it, and it's thoroughly loved already. It's uh, been phenomenally well accepted. Uh, everybody in town identifies completely with it. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the social commentary on this is that it is an image of our civilization and it has, and it's jarring, and it has parts that are rusty and parts that are chrome, parts that have color and parts that are black. And, uh, and he took it very lightly. When it was just finished, some of the workmen put a boot on top of that ogre bit that sometimes screws up and sometimes screws down and, and he liked the, the boot and he took it down from the ogre but he incorporated it permanently in another part of the sculpture. Uh, the boot is there now forever in the place. And the machine moves, as you can see, it's quite an active thing. The wheels turn. There is a huge raceway here with hollow steel balls, one foot in diameter, then go up this thing. As you can see the ball there and then they come wishing down the speedway. And that was in allusion, of course, to the Speedway 500. And, uh, and John Tingle is an absolute fanatic of racing cars. And, uh, and you can see that white disc on the other side is full color. The same with that chrome square is painted at the other side. And the machine, during the day, the machine turns on a pivot here, turns very, very slowly continuously back and forth and you can hardly see it move. And twice a day and the actual times have not been completely settled. We want this first to respond to the life of the town and then we'll set the time fixed at, at the end of this year. Then all, the whole machine goes in movement or it can be put in movement for any special occasion. And it's, a, it's really a great piece of sculpture. It's a most marvelous piece. He was going to do it in Paris and ship it here, but he came in and he got so enamored with the whole thing that he built it in Colombo, using as many 
Columbus engines or, or pieces as he could. The only thing that he brought from Switzerland are the big wooden wheels that he had them in his studio. And as you can see, it's quite different from different points of views, and it changed in scale and in relationship. And that's Jean Tingley on top working on it. And that's the in the space again. And this is looking towards the shopping area. You can see the mirrored wall to the left and the skylight that completely doubles up and how it looks late at night with uh, the Sears at the end. <coughs> Looking around the, the, the center, this is the, the back end of it, the Sears entrance. And this had to be built completely up, you know, within Sears internal standards and Sears levels of cost, etc. This is the beginning of the work. 